Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, a weekly show right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Of course, every single week on Felony Friday, I focus on shining a light on injustice in this nation's broken criminal justice system, and that's exactly what we're going to do this week. I have a great guest I'm going to introduce in just a minute here. You don't want to miss it. We have an incredible topic. We're going to be talking about the polygraph test. I have an expert in polygraphs, a guy who has been fighting for justice in this fraudulent industry for a very, very long time. I'll introduce my guest in a minute. I want to tell you a couple notes first. We have three shows on the Lions of Liberty podcast. This is one of them. We have a show every Monday hosted by Mark Clare, where Mark interviews leaders in the Liberty movement and hosts roundtable discussions. Every Wednesday, we have a show called Electric Liberty Land, hosted by Brian McWilliams. It is your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty. And then we actually have four shows. I lied. (laughs) Sandwiched between those two shows, we have a temporary show. Um, It's called Candidates of Liberty, where we interview libertarian candidates. I know, shocking title. And we talk about their campaigns, uh, why they're passionate about the ideas of liberty, and really get into why they think it's so important to run for public office as a libertarian. So that's every Tuesday. Be sure to subscribe to the Lions of Liberty podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Stitcher, uh, tune in. You can just yell at your Alexa, play Lions of Liberty, and it'll start playing. There's so many ways to listen to the Lions of Liberty podcast. This episode, as most episodes of Felony Friday, have the full video interview on YouTube. Um, they're all on YouTube. Some are just the audio. But most of my recent episodes of Felony Friday, you can go to YouTube and see the uh, the, full, the video of the interview. So be sure to check that out. Go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. And that's it, guys. This is the 142nd episode of Felony Friday. The show notes page for that episode, for this episode, is lionsofliberty.com slash FF142. Definitely take note of that because there's a couple things you're going to want to check out that I'm going to post to that show notes page. So let's get rolling with today's interview. My guest today on Felony Friday is Doug Williams. Doug, back in the 70s, administered polygraph examinations for the Oklahoma City Police Department. That was from 1972 to uh, 1979. In 1979, he began teaching people how to beat the polygraph. Um, Due to that teaching and due to protesting, and as he says um, on his website, protesting the loudest and longest, against the polygraph, against the use of the polygraph, he was incarcerated uh, in federal prison for two years. And Doug was finally released uh, back in July of 2017. And we'll get into all that stuff. And uh, we'll talk about and find out about how the polygraph works. So Doug, welcome to Felony Friday. Thank you, John. It seems like you've done your homework. So you're, uh, you're very well versed on my um, uh, Infamous background. I, I, uh, I, I uh, by the way, that that uh, that description of why I was actually prosecuted was not from me. It was from John R. Schwartz, who was the uh, Customs and Border Patrol polygraph examiner, who was behind that Operation Liebusters that that came after me. And he he said publicly uh, at at a meeting of the. Uh, uh, you, uh, the Police Polygraph Examiners Association, that uh, that's why they were they mounted this that this whole uh, investigation was because I had protested the loudest and the longest against the polygraph, and they are they are just, you cannot you cannot even begin to understand the depth of the hatred that those uh, thugs and charlatans in the polygraph industry have of me because. I have uh, exposed them for just that, the thugs and charlatans, and, and have exposed the, the polygraph uh, as a fraud. And, and uh, I call it the uh, longest running con game in the history of the world. Yeah, it, it's a big industry too, right? And we can kind of, we'll, we'll jump around a little bit. I, I do want to get your sort of origin story and how you got into it, but let's, let's kind of start 
with uh, some current events here around the polygraph. Yeah. Something yeah. that's in the news right now um, is the you know, Supreme Court hearings with uh, Kavanaugh, and he has an accuser who has come forward and says that she took a polygraph. So when that gets out in the media and they say, oh, she passed a polygraph, so it must be 100% true. What, what goes through your mind when you see something like that? Well, it's the, the very first thing that happens in my mind when people trot out the polygraph to, uh, uh, to try to increase the uh, public acceptance of their, the veracity of their statements is that that raises a big red flag to me. If you're telling the truth and you have a, a, a valid complaint, which I don't know whether she does or whether she doesn't, mm -hmm. but if you do, if you are telling the truth, there's no need to, to bring out a polygraph to, to back it up. A polygraph is a, is a desperate measure, usually by people who, who, have, a, who have a problem uh, with, with thinking that people are not going to believe what they have to say. So they, they you know, and it's just, it's just the timing of it was all, all weird. And the fact that she had uh, taken this polygraph evidently some time ago and then then uh, came came out and, and and made the accusation and said, "I have a polygraph test to back me up." But you know, the polygraph it, it, the, there's a lot of um, public acceptance for it. it. It's a it's a it's a it's a big public relations weapon for sure because people don't understand the limitations of the polygraph and how how easy it is to to uh, beat it, so to speak. But you know, it, it always braces. Uh, of course, I've I've got reason for 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 doing it, feeling that way because of my expertise with the polygraph and my knowledge that that it, it's a fraud. But you know, it, it's it's a pretty smart public relations move on her on her part because, and uh, I'm sure on the lawyer's part that pro that that uh, talked her into doing that. But you know, it, it'll it'll all come out in the wash, and and most people now. I was been following a lot of that on Twitter on my Twitter account, and, mm -hmm. and it's 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 really amazing to me how many people are now becoming more and more educated about the problems with the polygraph and the fact that it really is not uh, accurate and reliable as a lie detector. So you know, public opinion is really not not going to be swayed much by waving the what flag of a past polygraph, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's it's harder for the media to control the narrative nowadays. It's harder to get to, you know, block out someone, a voice like yourself, who's raising awareness about this. You can come on a podcast like this. You can, you know, have a YouTube video, all kinds of different avenues in order to reach people. So it's it's easier to get that information out, which, which is a very good thing, which is uh, kind of why I wanted to have you on to kind of take us through really the details behind how a polygraph works, um, how you used to teach people how to beat it, and why the federal government really felt the need to to shut you up or to to try to shut you up. So, let's yeah, <laughs> the polygraph. Do you know? I guess it, it, did, like, it didn't work. We're talking right now. So uh, yeah, they, I, they put me in there to shut me up, and they ended up giving me about a million dollars worth of publicity. I had a big big interview with uh, 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 National Public Radio on their uh, show, This American Life. Um, much, of, much of it was recorded right there on the federal prison telephone at 15 minutes of wax. So, you know, it, it's basically, it, I, I, I refer to it as the Streisand effect. I'm not sure if you're fair, aware of what the Streisand effect is. Back at the beginning of the internet years ago, um, Barbara Streisand was very active. I guess she still is to some degree. Anyway, she was very active as a, as a green type person. And she was talking about how everybody needs to quit uh, watering their lawns and wasting uh, precious uh, water and all that. So somebody took an aerial view of her estate in, in uh, California right. and it showed how green and lush it was compared to all the surrounding properties. And uh, so she filed, she tried to file an injunction to have this picture and this footage removed from the inter internet. And so, and, and as a result was, but prior to her, filing that injunction and getting all the publicity from having done so, there were maybe 500 views of that video. After she filed the injunction, there were in the millions uh, immediately after, after getting the publicity of filing the injunction. That's, they, that was referred to then after that 
as the Streisand effect. The more you try to cover something up, the more you try to silence a person, mm -hmm. the more people want to see what it is you're trying to, to, to keep from them. Yeah. So makes sense. That's, that's exactly the same thing that's happened with the polygraph thugs when they came after me. They, they, they tried to shut me up and then everybody says, well, well, you know, wait a second now. And, and one of my things, one of my parts of my argument with it, that I got a lot of interviews from the time that I was indicted all the way up to the time I was uh, actually incarcerated. And uh, one of the things I was saying was, you know, uh, if, if, if the uh, polygraph really works, what are they so afraid of? Why, why are they so frightened of me explaining to people how, how it works? And, and the, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, if I can teach a person how to control every tracing on the polygraph chart and to produce a perfect truthful polygraph chart, regardless of whether or not they're lying or whether they're telling the truth, then that's prima facie evidence that the polygraph is absolutely worthless as a lie detector. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, up until the time they, the very day, up until the very day that they in, indicted me, they had always maintained that it was impossible for me to uh, teach a person how to beat it and that if anybody tried to employ these countermeasures that they referred to them, uh, using my technique to try to manipulate the chart, that they were they are able to spot all those countermeasures and and call the person on that, uh, uh, so that they basically they had denied all the way up to the time they indicted me that it was impossible for me to teach a person how to beat the test until they indicted me for doing just that, which is an admission that I can teach a person how to beat it, and further that the United States federal government is very well aware that I can do that. Uh, they, they came out and very strongly and, and uh, basically admitted that uh, it, what, what part of my uh, restrictions of my supervised release, you go to, go to prison for whatever your sentence is. In my case, it was two years. And then after that, you're, you have what they call a period of supervised release. In my case, it's a, a period of three years. So during the period of my supervised release, one of my restrictions of my supervised release is that I'm not allowed to give this polygraph test instru uh, passing instruction to, to people to learn how to pass their test. They even came out and said that it, it was a, a, a threat to national security for me to teach people, basically to teach people what is a, a, a derivation of the Lamaze natural childbirth relaxation uh, technique. Uh, that's all I did was, was take and modify a, a relaxation uh, uh, technique from the Lamaze natural childbirth technique. It's ridiculous. It, it is ridiculous. And if anything, you know, by you showing people how to beat the polygraph, you've invalidated this, really, this system of interrogation, right? This, uh, you know, if you want to call it that, or this technology. It's, it, it doesn't work. And by doing that, you've really expose them but you've done that you they should be thanking you because <laughs> you know that's exactly right and i've always said you know they've, they've maintained for many years that, that and then they even came out and said it in the in the court hearing and in my uh uh motions i had i filed a motion per se when i was in prison to uh, get that restriction removed they denied it the judge finally ruled on it now i'm in the appellate court 10th 10th uh, 10th circuit appellate court filing all of my own appeals by myself but uh, uh, they, they keep saying that it's a threat to national security. And in my, one of my appeals, I, I said something to the effect that, okay, now the, the, the government says that it, it's a threat to national security for me to do this training, which basically, as I said, is just a, a training and a relaxation technique. But I would, I, would, I would ask, I would pose this question, and I did to the court. Uh, I ask you, who is the greatest threat to national security? The polygraph examiners who claim that we should rely on this, their technique, which has proven to be uh, no more accurate than the toss of a coin, or me, who stands up and says, wait a minute, this is a threat to national security to rely on the polygraph test results to protect our national security and the integrity of the criminal justice system. So I am a, I'm, I'm like a person who's 
who's standing out in the road on a dark, rainy night and saying, stop. Almost the like a bridge, whistle, like a whistleblower, really. No, the, the bridge ahead is is out. The mm -hmm. bridge ahead of you is down, but, and and the polygraph guys are are there, like traffic cops, waving the people on. No, no, keep going, full speed ahead. There is no problem here. There is no problem here. This, the polygraph is one hundred percent accurate. Well, they have a vested interest in doing that because it's a four billion dollar a year industry. And they don't give a damn how many people get hurt by being falsely accused of deception or how much in jeopardy the country is by relying on that ridiculous technology to protect our national security as long as they can continue to line their pockets. That's all they care about. So I think uh, all of the uh, most of the government agencies, CIA, FBI, NSA, I'm pretty sure that they all use the polygraph in their entrance, uh, you know, background I mean, checks and whatnot, but it's, it's not admissible in court, is it? Only in rare circumstances, but in what they call an agreement and stipulation where both, both attorneys, defense and prosecutor agree that a certain polygraph examiner will be used and, and that we, they will not object to the, to the polygraph results being entered into evidence, thereby uh, negating their chance of appeal. So that's, that's one way. I mean, the, and the other ex exception is the wonderful enchanted state of New Mexico. They allow polygraph results to be entered into evidence hmm. as direct evidence. That's the only state in the union that does it. But, and I just, I, I've, I've been, I've testified in the state of New Mexico a few times and was, was scheduled to testify again here just recently, but the, they withdrew the polygraph as evidence because they didn't want to go up against me in court. So this is a, a big industry, right? So other than the, the federal government using it to screen their prospects, who, who else is using polygraphs right now? Oh, there's a, there's a lot of use. It's being exported all over the world now. The UK is starting to use it a lot. Uh, uh, Israel uses it a lot. South Africa, uh, a few other foreign countries. Mm -hmm. uh, Canada uses it a lot. It's kind of interesting in Canada, the... Uh, the insurance company has got a pretty good scam going on involving polygraph. If you have a claim against an insurance company for a major loss, a car theft or fire in your house or something like that, they require that you submit to and pass a polygraph test before they will pay the claim. Wow. And, and guess who pays for the, and I mean, of course the insurance companies love that and they, they, um, they make sure and give the polygraph examiner a real good fee to, to uh, help him along. But it's, it's a scam. A, a lot of, a, a lot of, uh, of course, police departments use it. All the federal governments, the, uh, the military, um, no, the uh, intelligence and uh, the law enforcement sections, and uh, CIA, FBI, NSA, Secret Service, uh, Department of Homeland Security, all of those use it. Uh, and then many major police departments use it. And, uh, and then, of course, I, I was one person most responsible. I'm not saying that. The, the American Civil Liberties Union said that. I, I was given an award, a volunteer advocate award, for uh, being the one person most uh, responsible for the passage of the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, which prohibits its use in the private sector. I testified in Congress in 1985 and lobbied for pa passage of the, of the bill until it was passed into law in 1988. And at, in, in one fell swoop, we put uh, a, a, about 10,000 polygraph examiners out of business overnight. So you can understand why they hate me because I, I took away literally billions of dollars worth of business from them. Back then, there were eight to 10 million people a year having to submit to polygraph examinations one day. And in the next day, it was a violation of federal law to even ask anybody to take a test. You know, it's, it's really amazing. So that, that passed, you said 1985 is when that went through? I testified in Congress in 85 and it was passed into law in 1988. 1988, okay. And so it's, the thing that just is so striking to me is, so our federal government, these uh, national security agencies are using the polygraph to screen people, you know, if they are going to work for them or if they can get access to top, top secret information or, or whatever. And you're telling me that they are basing these hiring decisions and these information decisions of national security on the flip of a coin. Exactly right. And it's, 
it, it's it's really sad because there is a, 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 a ridiculous failure rate on, on all the agencies that use it on average and this is by their own uh, own reporting their own statistics 70% of the people who apply for positions with those federal agencies are denied employment because they failed a polygraph examination. Now, the, that's terrible. But, <clears throat> but what's even worse is that when, they're failed, when they fail it, they're blackballed and their, their name is put on a list and they, they are never allowed to apply for a job with the federal government ever again in, in any capacity that requires a polygraph examination or a security clearance. So these people have spent literally years and tens of thousands of dollars preparing for a career only to be torpedoed by this thug who sits there and says, uh, well, no, he, he didn't. He doesn't have to. He just, a liar. just call you a liar. He did not pass the polygraph test. He failed the polygraph test. We, should, we see signs of deception. Now, he doesn't have to offer any evidence whatsoever to back up his accusation and there's no appeal from his decision, and 70% of the applicants are denied employment and blackballed by these thugs. That's, it's unconscionable. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, so, so follow, follow me along this, this train of logic here. So I think I remember seeing it in one of your videos that, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe liars or maybe uh, people with, uh, Maybe a mental illness, maybe uh, psychopaths who are you know don't don't quite have the uh, the ethics and don't you know are, can can lie more easily, are able to beat a polygraph more easily. I think I remember you saying something like that. So w wouldn't that lend you to believe that um, these governments that are using the polygraph are more likely to allow psychopaths and people who are mentally ill into these roles? Yeah, I think they call that the law of unintended consequences. But that's exactly right. The, and I said, the, my empirical evidence has shown, and this is based on over 6,000 polygraph examinations that I personally have run. And then to, to the 40 years of hearing stories from people whose lives have been ruined by that, uh, that there's, there's just, it actually has a built-in bias against the truthful person. Uh, the more honest you are, the more well-developed your sense of your conscience, the, your, your sense of right and wrong, uh, the more likely you are to fail a polygraph examination and the, and the more uh, of an old thief and a liar and a con man you are and the more hardened your conscience, the better your chances of passing it. So it's, it's, it's just really a sad, sick joke. And, and unfortunately, the joke is on literally millions of people a year. Now, you've got to understand that the polygraph examiners have a vested interest in failing as many people as they can. Uh, these polygraph thugs, uh, they, they are GS, G, most, uh, they top out around GS-15, most of them average between GS-13 and GS-15, which is a good salary. And then on top of that, they-, what, they what, is, what is that salary? Just, oh, it, it, it varies because they get, it, it's adjusted for inflation all the time. It used to be around 110, 125, yeah. 150,000 a year. And then they-, they, uh, they um, form these companies and uh, hire these private polygraph examiners and then are, are instrumental in getting them uh, contracts with the government to take care of the uh, overload of the polygraph <coughs> tests that they can't administer themselves. Just for instance, the, the Customs and Border Patrol, the, the agency that came after me and probably one of the worst uh, uh, offenders in the polygraph realm, they, uh, they test oh, thousands and thousands of people every year. And the, and the, the polygraph firms that are employed uh, and contracted with by the Customs and Border Patrol, uh, I saw a report here a couple of years ago, and I'm sure it's probably gone up by now, but even back then, they were charging $2,200 a test. So you gotta figure, okay, well, if we go in there and we hire everybody that comes in and, has a, and looks to be reasonable and, and does a fairly good job on the test, then we won't be running that many tests. But if we flunk about 70% of them, then we get to run test after test after test at $2,200 of wax. So like I said, the, the, uh, the, the, they have a vested interest in failing as many people as they can because the money's there for them to do that. So, but you got, let's just, you talked about earlier about, let's just 
how, how does this polygraph work? And what, yeah, why, yeah, let's get into the details why, of that. Yeah. Why do, why do we rely on it so much? And I guarantee you that people, when they understand, and I go through and explain, I, I used to put on seminars a lot and, and, go, and uh, teach people how to pass it and, and that back when, before I was uh, in my crusade. By the way, a quick plug for my book, my, not my new book from, from uh, the, the False Confessions, The True Story of Doug Williams' Crusade Against the Insidious Orwellian Polygraph Industry will be published soon. I'm getting some really close. I'm getting a really good agent anyway. I go through there and <clears throat> talk all about my crusade that was started in 1979 and continues to this day. <clears throat> but before I got the Employee Polygraph Protection Act passed, I used to bring people in and <clears throat> train them on how to pass it because everybody had to take it from a job for 7-Eleven to bank tellers, you name it, they had to take a polygraph test to, to, to get the job and to keep it. And so I would go through there and put on the seminar and had my own polygraph and I'd set them up and I'd say, okay, now let's, let's first understand how this thing works. And, and so the, in, in understanding how it works, you will then be able to uh, understand how easy it is to manipulate it and to produce a truthful chart. Mm -hmm. and, and so you won't be intimidated by these guys when you go in and take the test and, and, and you'll know that you can produce a truthful chart. So, so I would start off and I'd say, okay, uh, <clears throat> and I had my polygraph there and I would bring my polygraph up and set it up. And, and the polygraph is, is uh, and you can see, uh, in, you can see videos on my website, polygraph.com that explains all this and demonstrates it. Uh, I've demonstrated how to, how to pass the test and how to, how it works for probably hundred times in the last four years. But anyway, so the videos are there and you can, you can, you can, when you when you finish this pop listening to this podcast, you can go over there and see what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll post uh, I'll post one of them on the show notes page, yeah. so people can see yeah, it. Right yeah. there, yeah. They can look at and see what I'm talking about. But it's basically very simple. The polygraph is a very crude reaction recorder. It records uh, your pneumograph and your, your, your breathing. Basically, it's a machine that can watch you breathe, watch two fingers on your right hand sweat and watch your heart beat. So the, the breathing the, is recorded by what they call pneumograph tubes. They're expandable uh, tubes that are placed around a person's chest and stomach. And when you breathe in, the pins, uh, the, pin, the you know, tubes expand and the pin goes up. When you breathe out, the, pin, the tubes contract and the, the pin goes down. So in other words, you've got the, the pneumo tracing on the chart and it's just a, when you breathe in and out. In and out. So it's just in measuring the evenness of your breath. Amplitude of your breathing pattern, in and out, chest and stomach. Then on your first and third fingers of your right hand, they place electrodes, which measures what they call the, the galvanic skin response, the GSR. That's simply a measurement of the increase or decrease in the sweat activity in your hand. The more you sweat, the more, higher the pin goes. The less you sweat, the lower the pin goes. So it's just another tracing that's traced out on, used to be traced out on a rolling sheet of paper. Now it's on a computer screen. Still the same thing. Mm -hmm. Then they measure your, what's known as the cardio tracings, basically the heartbeat. Uh, they place a cardio cuff around your left arm, which is similar to what the doctor uses to test your blood pressure, and you pump it up halfway between the, the, the systolic and the diastolic, and it measures your heart rate. Every time your heart beats, the pin moves up and down. So it does the tracing of the cardio. So you've got your pneumo tracing, watching you breathe. You've got your GSR tracing, watching the sweat activity on your hand. And you have the cardio tracing, measuring the heart rate, blood pressure and pulse rate. Faster your heart beats, the faster the tracing goes. Right, right. The higher your blood pressure, the higher the tracing goes. Very simple, very crude reaction recorder that records your blood pressure, your pulse rate, sweat activity on your hand, and your breathing. So it can watch you breathe, watch two fingers on your right hand sweat, and watch your heartbeat. That's all it can do. It can't. This is this has been the same technology since you started in the '70s until today. The same technology since since it was invented by Dr. Larson back in 1921 okay. has not changed one bit, not one bit. The only technology that we use that is like the technology that was in existence in 1921 is your basic toaster. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> now, they still, they, 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 they entrust our national security 
to these jokers, these charlatans, with this, what is really nothing more than a magic eight ball. Actually, a magic eight ball is probably more accurate most times. <laughs> so, uh, and how would, got, so, so, go ahead. I was going to say, so how would you, if somebody, so let's say it's somebody who, who came to you back when you were teaching these for job interviews and they said, you know, I get nervous when I'm, you know, really just answering just regular questions. How, how do I make sure I pass this polygraph? Well, that's very simple. All you got to do is understand how the polygraph is scored. There are two different types of questions on a polygraph, relevant and control. Now the relevant questions are obviously uh, those that pertain to the point at issue. If we're, if we're doing a, a job interview test, mm -hmm. then uh, the, obviously those uh, questions that are relevant questions will be, did you tell the complete truth on your job application? Are you withholding any information that would impact your uh, 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 employment? Are you, do you have any uh, re nefarious reasons for seeking this employment? Mm -hmm. uh, questions that pertain to the point at issue, whether your fitness for the job, basically. Then they intersperse in there what's known as control questions. Very general in nature, nonspecific in terms of time. Uh, have you ever lied to anyone to, uh, to trusted you? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever hurt anyone? Just general questions that are called control questions. So they then they ask you a relevant question and then a control and a relevant control. So they ask you the relevant questions and intersperse in between the relevant questions, they intersperse then the control questions. So in order to pass the test, you've got to understand how the, how the, the polygraph is scored. If you, to, in order for you to pass a polygraph test and in order for you to, to be designated as being truthful, then you just simply have to have a reaction on the control questions that is greater than your reaction to the relevant questions. So it's logical to assume that if you if you're, have a reaction and your heart starts to beat faster and your fingers start to get sweaty and your breathing becomes erratic when you're asked, have you ever deliberately hurt anyone as opposed to did you lie on your job application? It's logical to assume that the control question bothers you more than the relevant question Therefore, it's also logical to assume that you've told the truth on the relevant question. If the reverse is true, and you have a reaction on a relevant question that is greater than your reaction to a control question, then they assume that you have lied. So the way to pass it then is to understand the difference between the control questions and the relevant questions. And then when you're asked the relevant questions, you don't internalize Oh my God, he's asking me if I lied on my job application and I, I didn't tell him about the job I was fired for because I came in drunk or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you think, you just go through this little relaxation training in your own mind. You can do it to yourself and, and say, okay, when, I, when I, I'm going to listen to the questions only to identify them for what they are. I'm, I'm going to listen to the questions, and when I hear the relevant questions, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to internalize the question. I'm just going to identify it as a relevant question. And when I identify it and label it in my mind as a relevant question, I'm just going to think about laying on the beach, watching the waves gently rolling into the shore. Wave after wave gently rolling into the shore. And that trigger for inducing that calm, relaxed feeling of laying on the beach is simply to label the relevant questions as relevant questions. Then when you hear the control questions and label it a control question in your mind, you simply think of the most frightening experience you've ever had. The time you got bit by a snake or wrecked your motorcycle or fell off the cliff or dang near drowned, whatever comes to your mind that, that induces a feeling of, of uh, intense, uh, of, of feeling that you're in jeopardy somehow to trigger that fight or flight response in you. Mm -hmm. that, then you just think about that, that incident and that will cause a, a reaction in your mind and, and it will show a reaction on the polygraph chart. So avoid having a reaction on a relevant question and manipulate a reaction on a control question. You can do this physically or mentally. 
Either one works just as well. Uh, uh, physically, it's just simply keeping a nice, calm breathing pattern on all the relevant questions. Keep yourself calm. It's just simple biofeedback. Mm -hmm. And then on a control questions, think of something frightening or do, do, do what I had originally used to teach back in the, when I first wrote my first manual back in 1979. I, I entitled it How to Sting the Polygraph. And I, I said, it, you entitled it a sting, the a sting technique, because a sting is when you con a con man and he never even knows he's been conned. So we're conning, we're conning the polygraph con man. And we also employ our stinger to do that. Our stinger is our anal sphincter muscle. And that's how I first realized how to beat the polygraph uh, was I, I, I've heard some cop friends of mine talking about a chase they got into and they were talking about how the pucker factor was way up there and, and they're, they're pinching donuts out of the seat in the, in the scout car and all that. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to my office that very, very night. We were, at a, we were at the bar drinking when they, we were talking about that. And I went to, back to my office and hooked myself up to polygraph and lo and behold, boy, they tighten up that anal sphincter muscle and you have the most wonderful little uh, blood pressure, pulse rate increase, cardio tracing increase, and it's accompanied by a GSR increase and an erratic breathing pattern. So you just tighten up the anal sphincter. I, I, I had a little phrase back when I was training people uh, back in the 70s and 80s. How to, how to, how to I wonder how many people right now listening to this podcast are, are trying that. Right I'm, now. Sure they're tr I'm sure they're <laughs> trying that. You can't even tell I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd always say the uh, polygraph operator is just an asshole with a little training. And if you're going to beat him, your asshole has to have a little training. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Takes an asshole with little training to beat an asshole with a little training. That's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, what's even, what's even that very same thing. I testified in Congress in 19, 1985 and, and gave step by step how to, how to pass a polygraph test right there on, in, in, in the Congress in 1985 and uh, submitted my, my manual, How to Sting the Polygraph, as part of the packet information, which then became uh, part of the congressional record and became part of the public domain. And, it, 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 and ironically, that was in 1985. Mm -hmm. 30 years later, almost to the day, in 2015, I was indicted by the United States federal government for teaching an undercover agent the exact same thing that I testified to in Congress 30 years prior. Unbelievable. Ain't this a wonderful fucking country. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about that indictment. I think you mentioned the, there was a whole operation named it at oh, Getty, yeah. you, is that right? Or? Operation Livebusters, boy. They were, Operation <laughs> Livebusters. They were, they were came, you know. Was it, it just you? Were there, other, were there other people teaching this, or was it just targeted at you? There, there was one guy that they got kind of to try it out before they came after me. Uh, so I forget his name now. Some, I think it's Chad something. Anyway, he, he, they, they, they got him, and the only thing, he didn't even have a polygraph instrument. And he didn't, ha didn't really have any experience. You know, the only thing he did was he would read my manual to the people who came to him for training. He would literally just sit there and read the manual to them and then tell them to basically keep their mouth shut and don't incriminate themselves when they went on. And, and, and they got him, indicted him, and he, he pled guilty and, and was sentenced to eight months, which I should probably have done. You know, you can't win when you fight the federal government. They charge, they uh, they come after you and they stack charges on you and they can, they they're going to do this and that and the other thing. So, you know, the, if, uh, my advice to anybody that ever that ever is indicted or investigated by the federal government is just roll over and play dead and, and beg for mercy. They usually won't get any mercy, but uh, you won't you won't have the the penalty the trial. There's a trial what they call a trial penalty. If you, if you make them go to trial, they get really pissed off at you and, and try to throw the book at you. So, but you know, it was, it, it was one of those deals where I, I, uh, I really I kept thinking that this was like a bad dream. It was gonna, it was gonna this, the judge was gonna throw this out of court as being in a terribly tra tra travesty of justice. And of course it never happened. But then 
a lot of it's my fault because my, my piece of crap attorney, when we went to lunch on the very first day of trial, after the jury was seated and the testimony was admitted the first full day of trial, they, uh, we went to lunch and he, he, t he at lunch, he kind of gets all uh, emotional. He says, I don't know how to offer a defense. I said, what? He says, I don't know how to offer a defense. I said, man, this is a fine damn time to tell me that. And I said, well, by then I was just pretty much beat down. And, and it, so I just told him, well, let's go back and, and make a, the, the best deal we can. You know, we have an adversarial proceeding here. Uh, and, and so it's a fight. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, prosecutors are going to put on the best uh, case that they can and, and put on the best. And, and, but and, and if you go into court, and your attorney chooses not to fight, mm -hmm. and he chooses not to offer a defense, then you, my friend, are screwed. Uh, in an adversarial proceeding, you, you, you must be an adversary. You must fight. You must pre present a defense. And if you choose not to do that, for what reasons of his own, I, I don't know. He, he was having some physical problems. I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer and was, was very concerned about that. To, all, re all that aside, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, if, if, it's a, if, you, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't fight, you're going to lose. One, one good for sure way of losing is to not fight. So I mm -hmm. wish I'd have fired him. I wish I'd have uh, handled my own defense. I'd probably still be in prison if I had, so it may, may have turned out. Yeah, but still, it's, it's one of those deals where... Can uh, can you talk about the sting operation, how, how they got you? Well, that was a, that's, another, that's another weird deal. First, they, they were going to charge me with, with uh, uh, they, invest, they investigated me for three years. And they, uh, and they were going to charge me, had 100 different federal agents involved in it, 30 different federal agencies at one, at one point or another, to some degree or another, were involved. And they were, uh, they were going to first charge me with, uh, obstruction and then and they realized well no you can't do that you can't you can't work a conspiracy they're going to conspiracy mm -hmm. but you can't do that because uh, it's, you can't conspire with a federal officer to, so uh well we have to come up with something else so so then they they came came up with uh witness tampering three counts of witness tampering two of them were from these undercover agents who came in and, and supposedly lied. Well, they were lying. They supposedly told me they intended to lie on a polygraph examination, although there never was really clear that they had said that. And I never did tell them to lie, but that's all it's that. I didn't get a chance to put any of that in court because we didn't, we didn't fight it. We didn't present our side. So that's a, that. But so they, they, they came up and said they was going to charge me with witness tampering. Two counts of it was uh, these undercover agents. <laughs> Uh, teaching me, teaching them how to beat the polygraph test, supposedly. And then the uh, third one was uh, an email that they had recovered from. They took my phone. They came in and took everything, my computers, phones, everything. And they went short through all my emails, and they finally found one that is that's one unidentified woman. They didn't know who she was. I'm assuming it was a woman because she named had her name was a woman. Uh, but they didn't know who she was uh, or, or even if it was her name. They were never able to talk to her or trace her down in any way. And I, of course, didn't know who she was. But she had said, I'm going to take a polygraph test for a police job, and I may not uh, want to or be able to tell the complete truth or something. So I just gave my stock answer that I did to everybody that ever can't ask me anything. I'd say, oh, it's no problem. Get the manual. Get the DVD. Look them over a few times. If you have any questions, give me a call. That was the third count of witness tampering there. And they, then, took your, they took your computer, searched everything, and that was all they found. Yeah, yeah. and then and then and then they gave me two counts of, of, of mail fraud, three counts of witness tampering, and two counts of mail fraud. And the mail fraud was because I had gotten my fee for the training through the mail. Now I can understand that if I advertise that I could teach you how to beat a uh, test or pass the test, mm -hmm. and was not able to do that then that would constitute mail fraud. Mm -hmm. If I can teach you how to do it, and I did teach you, and they admitted that I did, and they prosecuted me for that, then how is that mail fraud? But I never get to question them on that because we did not fight. So there you have it. So what, 
What, what was your What was your plea deal then at the end? I just told him to go make a plea deal. And they they were they were they were they they gave us a, this really good deal. They said they were going to merge all five charges into one, and then they would uh, get me on the. They, they would ask for the lower end of the sentencing guidelines, whatever that was. And of course, that turned out not to be true. They gave me pretty much the upper end of it. Uh, but and 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 then and then they they, they then they made me uh, forfeit uh, the, the uh, uh, one one undercover agent. I flew to see him. The other one, he came to see me, and they made me forfeit all the money that I spent on uh, that they had sent me for airfare and for my fee. They made me pay all that to the government. I had to pay for my, so basically I paid my own, uh, paid my own airfare and, and all, gave them back all the fees that they had paid me for the training. It's kind of like the way in China, you know, the, you have to buy the bullet that they use to execute you. Yeah. Kind of, what, kind of what happened to me. And what's even worse than that, now listen to this. When they seized all my computers and everything, they got a list from my uh, uh, email server, or from, from, my, from my, I used to take uh, you know, payments online through a, a credit card processing, and they got records of all those. They got records of five, almost five, 4,900 and something, 5,000 people who had either purchased my manual and DVD or got personal training over a period of like seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. 5,000 people. And they went out and I listened to the, the interviews that from, through the, from the tapes they gave me through Discovery. And every single one of them, they'd start off the interview by saying, we're not after you, we're after Doug Williams. And uh, they, they would ask him, did, you ever, did he ever tell you to lie? Or did you ever tell him you were going to lie or any of that? Not one person. And, and they sent hundreds of FBI agents out all across the country and interviewed every one of these people. Not one person out of those 5,000 people wow. ever said that they told me they were going to lie or that I ever told them to lie. So they ended up having to come along with these manufactured crimes of these uh, undercover agents who they came in and lied about lying. And then they charged me with witness tampering. Of course, they weren't witnesses to anything. They were lying about everything that they said. Uh, but... It's just, it, it's just, it was just such a, a travesty. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it was happening even, even when it was happening. But it's kind of funny when I, when I was locked up in prison, I had, I had self-published a little book that just basically uh, gave an outline of, of my crusade. It's called From Cop to Crusader and self-published it on, uh, on Create Space and put it for sale on Amazon. And anyway, I, when I was in prison, everybody always asked me, what you in here for and all that. And so it's such a, long and convoluted story i would just i would just had my wife send me some of those self-published books and, and i would just hand them out to these guys in prison and they would they'd read them in a few few days or weeks or so but later they'd come back and say man see now i know what i'm in here for i didn't pay taxes or i sold drugs or mm -hmm. i embezzled from my company or whatever he said i can't figure out what you're in here for did they, what, what, now did, did they throw me in prison for this? What the hell was the deal on that? Yeah. I'd say, like, well, you know, I, I, yeah. in fact, the, the guy, who, I, I, the fellow I met in prison, a fellow by the name of Jack Straw, who was a, 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 he was a, a, a police captain from Chicago, and we got to be good friends. And anyway, he, was a, he, he read my book, and uh, he, he he was a he was a writer himself and a really good uh, really good writer. Anyway, he came back and after a few days and after he read it, he said, "Man, he said, just very interesting story." He said, I, "He said I finally found one." He said, "I've been locked up for eight years, and I've heard story after story from all these jokers saying, well, I'm innocent and all that.'" And he said, "Until I'd look into their case, and I'd realize they aren't innocent. There's everybody, everybody here is guilty of something. Maybe they didn't do everything they're charged with, but they're guilty of something. He said, but I finally found one that wasn't. He said, you are the very first innocent man that I have ever met in my eight years in, in federal prison. And he said, this is a fascinating story. He said, you've written it about like a 200 page police report. Ain't nobody ever going to read it, but it's fascinating. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll help you. I'll rewrite this thing. And we'll make a book out of it, and which is exactly what he did. But one thing you got in prison is a lot of time. 
He would take every little episode, the time you're on 60 Minutes, when you're on Nightwatch, when you testified in Congress, whenever that guy came after you with a gun, when that lawyer tried to buy you up, all the different episodes that you talk about in the book, he said, uh, he'd interview me for hours and hours and hours on end. And then just recently, about three months ago, we finally finished. He went, he moved over to Kentucky to finish his sentence. And, and uh, we, he sent the, uh, the manuscript to a, a lady who's doing the editing for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, he just did a marvelous job. And well, turns out that the, the woman in, 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 out of California that's, that did the editing for us is married to a, a big deal in the, in the um, entertainment industries. He's got four Emmys and he's uh, produced over a hundred different script, uh, screenplays into movies and all that. Anyway, he started reading it. He said, man, that's the most amazing, fascinating story I've ever heard. He said, we got to do something like this. Well, long story short, they're in the process sometime this week. Uh, he's spent a lot of time uh, putting together a big presentation and uh, treatment for, for it. You know, it's, you're getting the, all the figures figured out for screenplays and all that. So looks like we may be on the process of getting a, an alias. I'm talking to Matthew McConaughey's people to I was, play. Me and, I was uh, just going to ask you, if, if you could pick an actor, who would you want to play? Oh, that'd be great. McConaughey's not bad. That'd be pretty good. Yeah, he'd be pretty good at it. You know, he's really good at those true stories. I mean, the Dallas Buyers Club and things like that. He did a really good job on those. So Mm -hmm. you never know what may come of it. But back to what you were saying, you know, they put me in prison and shut me up. and It looks like it's having quite the reverse effect. Yes, it certainly has, which which is a good thing. Um, So just a couple more questions. I kind of want to ask you really the origin of this. So you're working in the 70s as a polygraph administrator. What, what set you off? Why you, did, did you know for a while that it was a fraud and then all of a sudden you just threw your hands up and said, I got to stop this or what, what happened there? I know from the very de- first day in polygraph school that it was a sick joke, that it, that, it was, that it was a joke. It didn't work. It was a fraud. In fact, I remember I, was, I went to polygraph school in 1972. They sent me to a, a, a National Training Center of Lie Detection in uh, – downtown Manhattan in New York City. And uh, one of the guys I was, got acquainted with was in the hotel room next to me and he was in the, in the polygraph school with me. He was a retired FBI agent. And we went to, sc- to, the, to the school the first day. And, and after school, we came out and, and um, I said, well, let's go grab a bite to eat. He says, nah, I ain't got time. He said, I, I got to pack up. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I'm, I'm going to leave. He said, I can't, I can't. I can't countenance this. It's, it's a fraud and it's a sham. And he said, I, I just can't, I can't be involved in it. I said, man, you're going to lose your money for the school, which was a considerable amount. Mm-hmm. And uh, He said, no, I don't care. He said, I just can't do it. And he said, what he had planned to do was have a second career as a polygraph examiner after having retired from the FBI. But he, he, he just had too much integrity to do it. And I said, well, I, I can't, I can't leave. I know it's a joke too. I know it's a fraud, but I also know that it's a, damn good psychological billy club. I know I can, I know I can be a really good interrogator with this thing and I know I can get a lot of confessions. And so I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. And so anyway, I'm, that's what I did. I went back and I, 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 I was a, I was a really good hog killer. I mean, I, I was the best interrogator ever. I got lots of confessions, scared the hell out of a lot of people, but it was, um, it was, a, it just started wearing on me more and more every year. I got to have a really bad drinking problem and I was in my, I, I was just trying to, to uh, uh, sear my conscience, I guess you'd say. But uh, I think some, one thing I know why I came down, I relate this story in, in the book. Uh, one, one other thing, I, I came down real hard on this, on this woman who was trying to pull some political strings. Or her, she was the uh, sister-in-law of the uh, city manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, was the, the police chief and the, my my major supervisor came in and told me before she came in to go easy on her. Well, that's just like waving a red flag in front of a bull. And I mean, I came down hard on her and did get a confession, but it, it, it was very, very hard on her emotionally. In fact, she kind of almost went into a catatonic state, got in, got on the floor in a fetal position. And, and, and one of the things she said to me was, you know, why, why are you doing this to me? And I said, well, 
you know, the, the, I was, I, I, I got the confession and cleared the case, but there was no need for that. There was no need. It was just the idea of my, my ego and my pride and my, my, I don't know how you call it. It was just the idea that, that how dare you, bitch, come in here in my office and think you're going to lie to me and get away with it because you pulled a few strings and you've got the chief to come in and tell me to go. I'll guarantee you, not only am I not going easy on you, I am going to utterly destroy you if that's what it takes. I win. I always win. And anybody that comes up against me loses. Simple as that. There is no, there is no other way. I don't know how else to play the game. And that's just the way I would. Uh, but after a while, it starts to get to you. And then I, I saw more and more evidence of how it was terribly abused in the, in the private sector. I did a lot of work privately, uh, running to pre-employment tests for different places. I made a lot of money doing it. But I'd hear them in their meetings. Well, I hit the local drugstore for 50 tests to fill three openings, which meant they probably called 45 or 47 people liars just so they could keep running test after test after test, which is what of course, we still do. But I couldn't countenance anymore. And I think the final straw was when I did, in fact, learn how to control and manipulate every tracing on the chart. I thought, well, you know, not only is it an insidious or willy an instrument of torture, but it can be beaten very easily. And, you know, if I'm not the brightest bulb in the tree. So if I can figure it out, there's no doubt a lot of other people have figured it out, too. So, and I didn't, you know, I didn't think it would take this long. And I certainly had no idea. I would have to suffer this much or, or, or put up with all the stuff that's happened to me just to tell the truth, just to protest against something that is an obvious fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, it's self-evident when I explain to people how it works and how, how, how crude it is, they're just astounded that, that we even still use it. But it's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a real hard thing to, to, to kill a, a myth that, that people like, they want to believe in it. They, the government wants to believe, although they know, they know it doesn't work. Just people, people always say, you know, if the polygraph doesn't work, why does the government still use it? And I always say the, the best answer I ever heard to that was from President Nixon. He says, quote, I don't know how the polygraph works. I don't even know if it works, but I do know it scares the hell out of people. And that's why I like to use it. Yeah, fear. Fear is a very, very persuasive. And the government does not like to give up things that they use to keep people in line. You, you, I saw this tweet, tweet the other day, and I, I knew it. They just reminded me of it with all the talk about polygraphs here. You understand? You remember that, that the Benghazi deal with those contractors there? Do yeah. you know that when they, when they, when that was going on for for a year and a half after that? Those guys had to take a polygraph test every week to make sure they weren't leaking to the press. Every week. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's just the fear. That's how they control. It doesn't, yeah, doesn't matter if they're... And the government will not give up easily, relinquish easily something that they use to control the people with. Yeah, well, that's... It's incredible. Really, really fascinating getting to talk with you, Doug. You know, I'm really glad that actually had a... Uh, we have a what we call our, our Lions of Liberty Pride. It's our, our patron group, some supporters that you know, help us to fund this show. And uh, I uh, sent out a message to, to them asking, does anybody know uh, anyone who's an expert in the polygraph and beating the polygraph? And uh, a guy came back to me and w with your name, sent me the videos. I'm like, holy crap, how have I not, have I not heard of this? So uh, yeah, really, <laughs> really awesome that uh, so quickly I was able to, to track you down and bring you on. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed visiting with you too, John. And I thank you for the opportunity to tell my story, and hopefully, not for my, my sake. You know, I don't. You know, I, I don't know if anything's ever going to come out good of this for me. So far, it hasn't been all that great. But for the sake of the literally millions of people who've had their lives ruined by this, these thugs and these charlatans, hopefully that that we can put a little bit more light on the subject and 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 maybe uh maybe someday we'll we'll put a stop to it
Yep. Well, that's what this show is all about, shining a light on injustice. So thank you for doing that, Doug. And I'll just give you, you know, a little more time here if you want to plug your website, your, your book uh, one more time, anything else? I, I, like I say, the, the book will be out soon and people can follow me on Twitter if they want. There's a, there's a link to my Twitter uh, feed on uh, polygraph.com. Really, polygraph.com is, is a very educational uh, thing. I, I'm not selling anything off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and there's a there's there's probably an hour and a half worth of bit of media clips on there that that's very educational. People people can watch it and, and look at it and make up their own mind of whether whether I, you know but who's who is the bullshit artist here, me or the polygraph thugs? Mm -hmm. I would submit that it's the polygraph thugs. I would agree with you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Doug. Really appreciate it. Thank you, John. All right. What a cool interview that was with Doug Williams. I really hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing it. A uh, really interesting topic for me, something I knew almost nothing about going into it. I did very little research. I don't know if that, if that uh, shown through, but I did that intentionally with uh, topics like this. I don't want to over-prepare because I want to be curious and I want to ask questions that listeners would ask. So hopefully you guys learned something. Um, if you were a polygraph expert coming in, you probably didn't learn much of anything, but I think most of you probably are not. Um, one thing I had no idea about was that polygraph technology has not really evolved at all over time. It's the same machine that they had back in 1921. And I think what's incredible, and I touched on this during the interview, that all of uh, the U.S., the, the federal government, these three-letter agencies, NSA, FBI, CIA, all of these so-called advanced agencies, which they all use the polygraph for hiring, for finding the right people, for security clearances, all that stuff. And it's an inferior technology. It's a fraudulent technology. It's a technology based around fear, using fear to get people to do things, to, to make them feel like, to, to limit them from, from doing different things. And on top of that, as Doug talked about, the people who are able to really fool the polygraph system without being trained in learning uh, Doug's methods that he teaches, the people who can just pass it naturally um, might not necessarily be the most ethical in society. Maybe they're already comfortable lying, comfortable stretching the truth, or they just don't care about lies. They could be a little bit uh, psychotic or they could be a sociopath. So it's kind of scary thinking that those are the types of people that just by sheer numbers, passing these polygraphs, getting security clearances, are going to end up in these leadership positions at these three-letter agencies. I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about it that way, but that's my understanding. Maybe I'm understanding it wrong. It's possible. But I think that's an interesting takeaway from this conversation. Of course, you know, Doug talked about really the war against him uh, just by the polygraph uh, community because he's, you know, really, it's just people's livelihoods. They've built lives around uh, being a polygraph administrators. And when you take that away, obviously people aren't going to like it. Very comparable to something like the war on drugs, where the war on drugs employs all these people, police officers to lawyers, to prison guards, to people who do everything in the prison, um, all this stuff. So people like that don't want to end the war on drugs and people who make a living administering the polygraph, you know, maybe they're okay with it being fraudulent. They don't care if it's uh, possibly dangerous, the, the things they're doing or ruining people's lives, uh, things like that. But hey, that's why I'm here. Uh, that's why we have this show. Uh, that's why I started Felony Friday. And that's why we have the Lions of Liberty Podcast Network in order to shine a light on stuff like this and get the word out. So Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Had a great time talking with Doug. Definitely check out the show notes page. I'm going to link to a video there. And I do want to thank the Pride member, the Pride member who reached out. And I want to thank Douglas M Maley. I think it's Maley. Douglas Maley. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Thank you for, uh, you know, 
connecting me with a couple of great articles, which led me to Doug Williams, polygraph expert. I found a couple of interviews through those links as well, too. I really appreciate that, Doug. And that's a great thing about the Lions of Liberty Pride. Doug is in the Lions of Liberty Pride. I wanted to talk to an expert um, in polygraph, somebody who understood the fraudulent nature of it. I don't think I'd heard of Doug. It's possible I did, but um, I hadn't researched him extensively or anything. And uh, I reached out to the Pride. They gave a suggestion, and they sort of helped to facilitate the show. How cool is that? So you could do that too. For as little as $5 a month, all of our Pride members get access to our Pride Facebook group. All of our Pride members get access to all of our bonus content that we release. So for $5 a month, you can get all that. Of course, you go $10, $15, 25 100 uh, you get a bunch of other different things from merchandise to uh, our Monday through Friday news links to um, we have our monthly uh, Skype call or Zoom call now with our uh, $25 and up members. And then, of course, uh, different things along the way. And one of the things we just had, which just ended, <clears throat> was we had a giveaway. Our, it's our five-year anniversary here at Lions of Liberty. We celebrated last Monday with Monday's episode, and we had a five-year anniversary t-shirt, which we gave deep discounts, and I think we're still giving deep discounts to our Pride members. We did, however, end um, giving out our, for new people to join the Pride, giving them this uh, this t-shirt. So that special is over, but you can still join the Pride, and it's, it's still worth it. I, I promise you that. So definitely consider joining the pride i've rambled long enough this was a long episode on its own so thank you all for bearing with me for listening to join the pride go to patreon.com slash lions of liberty that's all i got for today guys this is john odermatt signing off always remember to keep your head up and the fire is a liberty burning <laughs>